have Ms. Tia Silvesi, who is the Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent all the way in Orange County. So thanks to the world of technology, she can come here with us today and talk. Uh, she has a ton of background with horticulture and working for the University of Florida and their research labs and their extension offices. And she even studied in Hawaii. She has some pretty cool stories about that, working uh, with and for the uh, University of Honolulu, right, Tia? Uh, University of Hawaii. Hawaii. Wow, even better. So, <laughs> so anyways, um, Tia is here to talk about Florida Friendly Landscaping. We really appreciate you coming on today, Tia, and feel free to take it away. All right, great. Well, thanks for the welcome, Evangelon. And I was just up in Tennessee this summer. It's a beautiful place. Florida friendly landscapes are all about protecting the environment and having a beautiful landscape. In Tennessee, I know you guys have the Smart Yard program, the Tennessee Smart Yards. And as I understand, the Tennessee Smart Yards was kind of created from the Florida friendly landscaping program. So I'm with the University of Florida Extension in Orange County. So the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is developed in a partnership between the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and the University of Florida. And it reaches people in the residential, in the commercial realm, and professionals. It's really tailored to all different audiences. I mostly work with residential homeowners. The goal of the program is really to conserve water, minimize um, pollutants, fertilizer, pesticides going into the water, you know, have a healthier lawn with less impact, so more, more sustainable landscape. You can have a more sustainable landscape by using the Florida Friendly Landscaping nine principles. So principle number one, the right plant in the right place, this is the most important or kind of the overarching principle because if you just put a plant in the right place to start with, then it will minimize a lot of other problems that you might have with the watering or the pest control or the ongoing maintenance. And so today I'm just gonna run through these nine principles and give you some practical tips on how to have a Florida friendly landscape in Tennessee. So again, principle number one here, the right plant in the right place. Look at your site and kind of analyze, all right, where do I get sun? Where do I get shade? Where is it wet? Where is it dry? To match the plants to the site conditions. That's the, that's the bottom line. So here's a map of Florida. Um, I don't have one of Tennessee, but your local extension agents can, can help you out with that. But look at your USDA plant hardiness zone and then plant plants appropriate for your area. And also be mindful of what direction the sun comes from. You'll have a sunny side of your house and a shady side. And then within that, there will be microclimates that you know might be a little warmer a little cooler and you can grow you know some specialized plants in those areas so here's some more things that you want to look at your site conditions um, we recommend to do a soil ph test um, before you get started with your landscape and then you can match your plants to your you know ph level or if you're going to plant something special, you might need to alter your pH a little bit. As we talked about the soil moisture, whether it's wet or dry, also the drainage. Is there standing water? Is it well drained? What is the light? Also, what is already existing in the landscape? Walkways, driveways, trees you know, that you're not gonna alter when you sit down to do your plan. So next is you wanna make a landscape plan. So think about the function of the areas. Do you want a little lawn turf grass area where you can play or have your kids or your dog or a play set? Or do you want a vegetable garden, a butterfly garden? And kind of map these out in a rough sketch, you know, before you get to picking specific plants. Again, looking at where is the wet spots, where are the dry spots, and which plants will go good in those areas. When you're selecting the plants, when you get to that, check with your local extension agents and see what plants do well in, in your landscape, what are the good go-to, you know, native plants or hardy plants 
that do good in the Tennessee landscape. So what is their status? Are they native here in Florida? We have a lot of invasive plants that we recommend not to plant in the landscape. And also the mature height of the tree or the plant in the bottom right picture, you can see that palm tree and it's growing into the house. That's just the wrong plant in the wrong place. And that's gonna be an ongoing maintenance issue forever, just way too close to the house. And so think about your, your maintenance, like how much maintenance do you want? If, if you want to be out in your yard every day, putzing around a little bit, or if you just want plants that are drought tolerant and hardy and can survive barely any maintenance that don't need much pruning either at all. And maybe you want special functions, like you want to produce some food in your yard or you want to attract some pollinators like butterflies. So. These are some of the considerations. So we recommend choosing low maintenance plants. And in our area, here are some examples. We have the Kunti, which is native to South Florida. And then in the middle picture, that pink grass, that's a moly grass, which is also native. And we have the cabbage palm in the picture in the bottom left, which is our, our native palm tree. And then on the right hand side, the top, we have Liriope, which is very low maintenance. And then the Shillings Holly, which is a cultivar of a native. We call that a nativar. And it's very slow growing, very good for Florida's conditions. And so um, it's a good choice. It doesn't need to be pruned a lot. And that's why we consider it a low maintenance plant. Now, this is opposed to high maintenance plants like roses. In, in Florida, we get a lot of fungal diseases and the roses constantly need to be pruned and sprayed. Lettuce, it's just a short-lived, you know, vegetable crop. You know, you can harvest in 30 to 60 days and then you have to replant. These date palms get a lot of nutrient deficiencies in Florida. Unlike our native palm, the date palm often suffers from a, a magnesium deficiency where the lower leaves are turning yellow. And then some things like the picture to the right, that Podocarpus hedge, that is a low maintenance plant, but since they want to keep it real small like that, it naturally wants to grow like 10 to 20 feet, but they're trying to keep it pruned as a small hedge. So it becomes a high maintenance plant by the form that these people chose to have the plant in. So turf grass is Florida friendly. There's a lot of arguments about turf grass, but it does serve some functions. Grass is kind of known to be a very good biofilter of nutrients and pollutants. So like all plants, it absorbs carbon dioxide and releases oxygen. It's definitely better than concrete or rock because it collects the dust and the dirt. And it helps the water seep in and recharge the groundwater. And it also reduces erosion. So I know that's a problem in Tennessee. And um, not only turf grasses, but all grasses have a very nice fibrous root system that extends and is really good for stabilizing soil. So here's just a kind of continuous chart of what plants are earth friendliest. So bare ground is not very good. My One of my mentors called it a boo-boo on Mother Earth to have bare ground because Mother Nature just wants to grow plants or weeds. Or, so turf grass is better than bare ground. You're covering the soil, you're reducing erosion, and that's good. Um, shrubs, and as you get to trees, they can be the lowest maintenance plants because after they're established, they will require some water and fertilizer to get them established. But, you know, three or a couple years down the road, they will normally be able to survive off of uh, rainfall alone. Like look at the beautiful forests, you know, on the East Coast. They survive off of rainfall alone and they're predominantly shrubs and trees. So we advocate planting more shrubs and trees in the landscape, making landscape beds for them.
So um, principle two is to water efficiently. So over 50% of the irrigation used is for turf grass. And so we can reduce the need to water and conserve the water in our aquifer and our groundwater by choosing drought tolerant plants and grouping plants according to their water needs. That way, if you have several plants that have a high water requirement, you can be watering them all together versus mix matching some plants need a lot of water with some plants that don't need a lot of water together because that creates an imbalance and that might cause problems. And then as plants are established, you can gradually reduce how much water that you apply. Like I said, for established shrubs and trees, they could barely use any additional irrigation than rainfall. So we want to water thoroughly. So when you do, um, you know, when we're having a dry spell and you turn on your irrigation system or your hand watering using a sprinkler, then you want to water enough so it reaches the bottom of the root zone, but not too much where the water is just going deep, 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 really deep down in the soil. So what we recommend is a half an inch to three quarters inch per irrigation event. This is more often during active growth. And then in the winter, when plants go dormant, there's not so much a need for irrigation. You know, they might need water once or twice a month. And then in Florida, we have water restrictions. And so we have different days that we're allowed to water and that way people aren't wasting water. And this applies whether you have a private well or you're on city water or a pump. I have a little chart for people to follow. And then automatic irrigation controllers. So a lot of people move into a house and they have an irrigation controller and they don't even know how to use it. So our slogan is don't just set it and forget it, but pay attention to this. In Florida, when we get our summer rains, just turn it off. And then when the rainy season stops, turn it back on. And then when it's the winter time, we're reducing our watering again. And so you'll have to change it a couple times a year according to the seasons and the weather patterns. Uh, these automatic irrigation systems, they can be wasteful, you know, almost up to 50% more water because of that setting and forgetting it. Don't do that and pay attention to your irrigation timer and change it a couple times a year. What you can do to test or calibrate your irrigation system is what we call the catch can test. And so you put out these cups, you can use solo cups or tuna cans and just turn your irrigation system on for your normal runtime for that zone. And then measure in each of the cups, you know, how deep is the water. And so we're targeting about a half an inch, which you would see on the ruler, maybe to three quarters of an inch. If you have more than one inch of water in most of the cups, then just turn it down a little bit for, run it for less time, or you could consider putting in more efficient irrigation heads that output the water more slowly. So also in Florida, the rain sensors are required by law, and this acts as a shutoff device so when we get rain, it makes your irrigation, automatic irrigation timer not turn on. So it will conserve water that way. But one problem with these is the picture on the bottom right, there's those little brown and those can kind of go bad over time. So they do need regular maintenance. You have to check up on them, make sure they're working functionally. Uh, properly. Yeah, it's okay. They just need a lot of maintenance. So they, they need to make a better system here in Florida. The rain gauge is something everybody can use. This is the most low tech type of thing because you just put it outside, it rains and you look in it and you see how much rain. All right, maybe you got a half an inch of rain. So that means you don't need to water for the next couple days and then dump it out to reset it so you can measure the amount for the next rainfall. So you can buy that for, you know, three or five bucks. And it's a great um, tool for helping you to observe the weather and figure out how much rainfall that you got and maybe 
how much you need to irrigate your garden. Principle number three is fertilize appropriately. So our water quality is also negatively affected by nutrients that we put into our lawn and landscapes and they just get flushed down with the water with heavy rains into our water bodies cause algae blooms and other pollution so we want to fertilize appropriately and what this means is to fertilize the plants only to maintain the plant health not all plants need fertilizer all the time in fact, plants have an amazing ability to photosynthesize. So they have their green leaves and they collect sunlight with their leaves and turn it into carbohydrates. We just need to add fertilizer to whatever the plants may be lacking. Just um, you know, take a good look at your plants and decide if they need fertilized or not. If you're seeing some nutrient deficiencies like pictured here, where there's yellowing, then, then you may need to apply some additional fertilizer. Sometimes it's nitrogen. Nitrogen is one of the primary nutrients needed by plants, but it can also be other things like at the bottom, the iron chlorosis in the turf grass or for the palm tree mag magnesium. That's where your local extension agents can help you out. You know, if you have a plant looking kind of yellow, send us a picture of it. We can help diagnose what it is and how it can be corrected. That way you can apply the right fertilizer. So if your landscape looks perfectly green, then and everything is healthy, you may not need to apply fertilizer. Sometimes too much fertilizer will be bad. So if you're trying to get plants to flower and you add too much nitrogen, that will promote more vegetative growth and kind of hinder the flowering. Just keep that in mind. In Florida, we have a blackout ordinance where you are not allowed to fertilize between June 1st and September 30th. And that's based on the heavy rainfalls that we get during the summer. Fertilizer, the nutrients of nitrogen and phosphorus, they pollute the water bodies. And so when it rains, it will kind of wash those away and we don't want them to end up in our water bodies. So after September 30th, it starts to dry out in Florida, and that's a good time to fertilize. Now, you guys probably have the opposite up in Tennessee because, you know, by now you're kind of getting into fall and the weather is cooling down and the plants are. So for Florida, we have a naturally amount of high phosphorus in the soil. So we recommend fertilizer with low phosphorus and phosphorus is the middle number of the fertilizer bag. So you can see the bag on the right, it's 1608. So that's the 16 is the nitrogen, zero is the phosphorus, and eight is the potassium. And so this is uh, kind of what we recommend for general turf fertilizer and low phosphorus because it's naturally occurring in our soil. So this is where your soil test can help out to figure out, all right, what nutrients do you have in your soil and which ones do you need to add? And of course that, you know, keep the fertilizer away from draining down into your water bodies. If you spill it on the, in your landscape or on your hardscapes, like your driveway or sidewalk, you, you can just sweep it up and spread it out or put it back into the bag. Next, we're gonna talk about mulch. And mulch is a universal good thing for all kinds of plants. It has so many benefits proving soil fertility over time as it decomposes, cools the soil in the summer and warms it up in the winter. It helps to buffer the soil temperature. It also minimizes the water needs because it reduces the um, evapotranspiration. It inhibits weed growth, so get a nice layer of mulch and not so many weeds grow. And it just looks nice. It looks very nice. So the proper way to mulch is with a two to three inch layer of mulch. You wanna spread it out to the drip line of the tree. Now you do not want to pile it up on the trunk of the tree because that can hurt the tree. So 
You want to be sure to pull it back. That way it's not volcano mulching the tree and make sure you expose that trunk flare. We do not recommend gravel or rubber mulch in Florida friendly landscapes. It's okay to put a little bit of gravel, you know, right around your house or something. Gravel will actually heat up. It will get really hot and that's not good for our climate change and and our plants too will get really stressed from it. It also doesn't have those benefits that the mulch did, providing the nutrients and stuff to the soil over long term. The rubber mulch is okay for playgrounds, and stuff, but it's really not recommended because it can leach chemicals over time. There's still research being done on this. And again, it doesn't cool the environment, but it heats it up which could cause plant stress. Moving on to Florida fun principle number five, which is to attract wildlife. And as we become more urbanized and natural areas are plowed down and houses and apartments are built, we really lose a lot of the, the native plants that have fruits and flowers and nuts for the wildlife. And I feel like it's our responsibility to do a little part in giving back to nature. And what you can do in your yard is just plant a variety of trees and shrubs and grasses and flowers that plants that have flowers or fruit or nuts. And also providing a water source will help with the birds and the butterflies and the other creature. And then you could also provide a wildlife shelter like a birdhouse or a bee house or even some simple things like a pile of brush or letting a dead tree stand for some of the species like uh, woodpeckers and things that use dead trees. So if you want to uh, make a butterfly garden or a pollinator garden, here's just some basic tips for you. Plant a variety of flowering plants, lots of color. Try to get year round color in the spring, summer, and fall. And then for butterflies, you wanna plant a combination of nectar and larval host plants. A baby butterfly is called a caterpillar. Caterpillar is the butterfly larvae and butterflies will lay the caterpillar eggs on the plants that eat the, on the plants that provide food for the caterpillars. We have monarch butterflies in Florida and we tell people to plant milkweed. That's a great one for people to start with plant milkweed and it's a larva host plant for butterflies and uh, monarch butterflies and other ones too. I also plant them in groupings, like mass them together and that way there's a big bang of color. And then including native plants that were from your region because that's what the insects are used to. They have, you know, co-evolved the native plants with the native insects and so they provide food for each other and help them reproduce. Usually it's good to have these kind of butterfly gardens in sun or part sun for the flowering. And again, provide a watering source and don't spray pesticides in these areas or use them very sparingly because they can kill the butterflies and the caterpillars. What you wanna do for your area is get to know your butterflies and their larval host plants. So. Here's some of the ones that we have down here in Florida, and that's the monarch butterfly caterpillar in that center picture, a little cute thing. On to principle number six, which is to manage pests responsibly. We try to let people know that it's not really reasonable to have a completely insect-free disease and weed-free yard. Kind of managing the expectations to allow a little bit of those natural pathogens to be okay in your yard. Now you do want to set thresholds and if you have an infestation of something, you want to take care of that. And we as extension agents can help you learn how to look for that. There's actually many insects that are beneficial. Identify the beneficial ones, like you can see the praying mantis on the top there, and check your plants regularly, especially if you're growing vegetables. 
you know, check them for pests regularly. Then just don't spray your lawn or your landscape just because it's that time of the year. Always scout for pests and disease problems and then only treat affected areas. If you do decide you need to spray, we want to choose the least toxic spray option. Before you spray, you can consider other things like hand pooling, hand squishing bugs. Um, if you have aphids, you can kind of use the hose and jet blast them off the plant. Then if you're like, all right, well, these pests are really taking hold, then you can go to a chemical spray but of those sprays, use the least toxic ones first, like such as organic sprays. Um, at the bottom, there's uh, horticultural oil or insecticidal soap. Or in the middle is the thuricide, which is a bacterium, the Bacillus thuringiensis, or otherwise known as Bt. And that only kills caterpillars. So if you have caterpillars on your squash, then just start with the BT, you know, the organic one for the caterpillars. Try that first. You know, you might need to check every week and repeat the spray if necessary. And only if you have a really, really bad problem should you use any type of harmful, like toxic chemicals. Again, check with your local extension agent and they can help you figure these things out. Um, so here is a publication on natural products for managing landscape and garden pests in Florida. And a lot of these same um, you know, chemicals like the organic pesticides are available in Tennessee. And so you can look at this for some suggestions on what to spray or how to control and using um, biological pest control too. Like in the picture there, you can see the the green lacewing larvae eating that little aphid bug. So sometimes you just leave the pests alone and uh, mother nature and ecology will find the balance in your yard. So the next topic, um, Florida friendly landscaping principle number seven is to recycle yard waste. And I love recycling and composting. And again, this has so many benefits because one, you're reducing your waste, and two, you're making your own soil amendment. So you don't have to buy as much compost or fertilizer because by using a compost pile and breaking all this stuff down, you'll be creating your own soil amendment that you can later apply to your vegetable garden or to your lawn or to your landscape. So all these bags of leaves you see in the center picture, um, these could be spread into your landscape beds. They could be saved, like just throw the bag behind your compost pile and use them for compost, especially later in the summer when we don't have that much leaves or brown materials laying around. And you can even mulch your vegetable garden as pictured on the right with the leaves. And that will help to retain the moisture and the soil and protect from weeds. All of your organic materials, you can keep as many on your property as possible. Then you'll be recycling those nutrients and returning them to your soil and reduce your need for purchasing soil amendments or fertilizers. Of course, to be Florida friendly and environmentally friendly, you want to keep all of these organic materials away from storm drains, waterways, blow them off of the driveway or your gutters, clean those out. And that way it doesn't pollute our waterways. So moving on to number eight, which is to reduce stormwater runoff. We like to try to hold and sink and store our water on your landscape. We don't want, you know, heavy rains carrying a lot of soil and sediment and putting them into our water bodies. So there's several strategies I'll talk about here to keep and absorb that stormwater and protect our waterways. Here you see the picture of the, on the left, the grass clippings in the storm water gutter. So that is bad. That's actually illegal to do in Florida. And so the, the best thing here will be to, 
use a mulching mower where you return those grass clippings directly to the lawn. If they do end up in a gutter like that, then rake them out, bag them and put them on the curbside or compost them, then blow the gutter clean because when it rains, all that stuff will wash down into the gutter and eventually make all of our waterways green with the algae blooms. We want to keep that storm water clean. Um, one way that we can do that is we can cover the soil. So using ground covers, even um, mulches or shrubs or plants, and that will help to stabilize the soil. And, um, you know, turf grass is good, but if, if it's too steep or shady for turf grass, then you can use some other ground covers to cover that soil and hold it and prevent it from erosion. So we also recommend to use permeable surfaces, paver stones or gravel or that alternate driveway with the little blocks. That way the rainwater can seep into the ground, you know, recharge our groundwater supply and that way we can have that for, for later use. And then we also recommend rain barrels to help catch the water, uh, direct your downspouts into landscape areas and lawns, just don't direct it right onto your driveway that goes out to your road. So let these plants absorb the water as much as they can before you know it's it's wasted by going out into the street and into the drains. The picture on the right, these people actually made a pond and directed their gutter into the pond where it can be the water can be recycled and then anything extra can flow over the edge. Another thing you can do is to create swales or rain gardens. Swales is the low area and then berms is the high area and this helps to catch and hold and, and sink and filter the storm water so that it can go into the ground and get absorbed by the plants before leaving your property. Kind of wrapping up here, this is Florida Friendly Principle number nine, which is to protect the waterfront. If you're on a lakefront or a stormwater pond, you know, you need to be sensitive to that environment because it's right next to a water body we have problems with high levels of nitrogen and phosphorus in our water which can contribute to harmful algae blooms so what we recommend is to add some plantings like this purple pickerweed on the left or the the button bush pictured in the center and on the right hand is the giant bulrush so these are all aquatic plants that um, grow in Florida in or alongside of water bodies. But also just for general landscaping things, do not fertilize or irrigate, you know, within 15 feet of a water body. In Florida, the broadcast fertilizer spreaders must be equipped with a deflector shield, which you can see on the green spreader in the bottom left and so that way you can fertilize the lawn without also fertilizing the driveway and again if you do get fertilizer on the driveway then just sweep or blow it off you know back onto the lawn and again protect the waterfront by keeping your storm gutters clean sweeping them out or blowing them back into the lawn that way grass clippings and other organic materials don't enter our water body. If you are on adjacent to a lake or a pond, we recommend a 15 foot buffer zone where you don't use any fertilizer or pesticides. That should be like a minimal maintenance area that you don't have to tend to very often, but it can still look good and beautiful. On the picture to the left, there's some daylilies there. Uh, mixed in with some of that purple salvia. And in the center picture is our native sand cordgrass. And that makes a really nice, um, you can plant that on the uplands and it makes a really nice buffer. You can see there, it looks like there's a cypress tree in there and then some of, of our native um, cabbage palms. So that's a very nice, very environmentally friendly looking landscape as opposed to people who just have only grass or maybe nothing at all, you know, cut the grass and it goes into the water. So we want to protect our water quality and how we can do that is planting this vegetative buffer 
of plants to stabilize the soil and prevent erosion and um, filter out the nutrients. So just a couple um, resources about my program here. So I'm a Florida friendly landscaping agent and there's a link to our statewide program here. I'm out of Orange County, which is in Orlando, Florida. And you can follow um, my gardening posts and stuff on the Facebook page called Garden Florida. That pretty much concludes my presentation. If you wanna scan the little QR code with your smartphone or um, Evangelon, I think put it in the chat box, the link to our survey. And I'd be happy to take any questions at this time or if you guys have any more information about the Tennessee Smart Yards program, any tips for our viewers today? We have a question from the Mercers asking, uh, they say we have fire ants, how do we deal with them? Ooh, fire ants are a big problem. If they're in your vegetable garden, there's really no kind of like organic spray for them, but you can just disturb them or um, I've heard pour boiling water on them, but you have to use a lot of boiling water, so that can be tricky. Just the standard pest control for fire ants, like the Amdro or other products like that, that you can sprinkle on their mound, that also works. So those are a big problem, and they're pretty persistent. A little different situation here in Tennessee, because we have, we can grow zoysia grass, we can grow Bermuda, I guess we can do St. Augustine a little bit, Mm -hmm. But we can also do bluegrass, we can do fescue, cool season grasses. So we're, we're considered to be in the transition zone. So we have to deal with quite a few of those grasses. So it, it depends on what grass you've chosen. Most people choose fescue in their, in their lawn. You know, there's different strategies to get rid of the weeds, depending on what kind of grass that you chose for your lawn. Yeah, you guys have a lot of species of turf grass up there. That's cool. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm sure you have a very busy, busy schedule with all the COVID stuff going on. But um, thanks again to you for coming on. It's always great to see you. And it was kind of fun to, to work together again. Um, and again, if anyone has any more questions about Tia's uh, program, you can go ahead and give her a call. Uh, any closing, closing statements, Tia? Oh, well, thanks for having me. And, um, you know, let me know what else the Tennessee Smart Yards is doing that we could do back down here in Florida. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank definitely. you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Bye.